these words from Psalm 116. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. God's mercies endure forever. God preserves the humble. In all our distress, God hears us. We will offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. We will call on the name of the Lord in the courts of the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. be with you and also with you. Welcome to this service of virtual worship at Westminster Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you have logged on to this edition, which for August 16th, we have one month to go before we have our new pastor in place. Uh, Reverend Christopher Peters coming from Alabama. So uh, just, just a month to wait now, folks. And uh, we will start our newest chapter in the history of Westminster Church. We're glad for that. And we hope that as we continue to wait for God's time and Christopher's, 
uh, that you will uh, continue to worship virtually with us each Sunday, either on YouTube or Spectrum or Windstream, and that as we worship together with the people of God, dispersed and gathered by electronic means, that you will feel the presence of God's Spirit, which can never fail. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds to confess our sins. Knowing that God's mercy can never fail, let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that just like Jesus' disciples, we too sometimes lose patience with people who need our help and support. Like the disciples, we find ourselves wishing they would just go away and leave us in peace. In your mercy, forgive us. Remind us again of the deep love you showed toward us when we were still in need, a love so deep that it sent you willingly to the cross on our behalf. Show us how to love others as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. so loved the world that God sent the only begotten Son of God into the world, that whosoever trusts in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So, friends, believe and share the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are a new creation.
we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. Lord God, still the cacophony of our hearts and minds that we may attend to your word and heed the direction that you teach us to go in. In Christ's name, amen. The lectionary passages for this Sunday include Isaiah 66, 18 through 23. The prophet writes on behalf of God's voice. I know their works and their thoughts, and I am coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory and I will set a sign among them. From them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Put, and Lud, which draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands far away that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations, and they shall bring all of your kindred from all nations as an offering to the Lord on horses, and in chariots, and in litters, and on mules, and on dromedaries, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring a grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, and I will also take some of them as priests and as Levites, says the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath. All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the lectionary for the gospel passage is in Matthew 15. Within the words of the gospel, listen for God's word. Jesus left and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, is it? She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation within each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the last few years, we saw Russian-backed troops take control of the Crimea away from Ukraine. Then Russia claimed to annex the territory, and despite the current focus of the world on the pandemic, tensions between Ukraine and Russia remain rather tense. More recently, just weeks ago, despite the pandemic, in May of this year, China sent troops to push into territory that is claimed by India violating what India considers to be its borders. I bring these incidents up not in an attempt to analyze or say anything about the current conflicts in South Asia or Eastern Europe, but only to emphasize that it seems to be a part of human nature to be territorial and to erect borders and to be offended when it is perceived that those borders have been breached. Clearly, we have an example <clears throat> closer to home. 
Although I rather like the organization called Medical Sans Frontieres, Doctors Without Borders, who take needed medical advice into war-torn areas regardless of nationality. They don't pay attention to the borders, but only to the people. But for the most part, through human history, we have defined ourselves with our space and our borders, sometimes without bellicose purpose, because borders sometimes define what are the peculiarities about us. So Nebraskans in Norfolk have an affinity with people down here in Lincoln that they do not share with people in South Dakota, even though they are closer to South Dakota than they are to Lincoln, because they do, in fact, live within the borders of the state of Nebraska. And all Nebraskans share some common stories, some common heroes, legends, because of our peculiarity, our particular heritage. Even if you're from way out in Sydney or Alliance or Scotts Bluff, it's still Nebraska. One of the principal themes of the Hebrew scriptures is how God's choice of one peculiar, particular people was meant to be a blessing for all peoples, regardless of borders. Christianity is indeed an expansion, one could say even an intended exaggeration of that very theme, now which is how through Jesus, one particular person of Nazareth, the reign of God's love becomes effective for all people, indeed for all creation. Because Jesus was a particular person born within the heritage of one particular ethnicity, we have to deal with a certain number of peculiarities, particularities, which is specific about Jesus' life and his place within his own people. Yet within the witness of the gospel, today's gospel according to Matthew, we begin to see how even within the short days of Jesus' earthly ministry, the redemptive message was starting to push against those old borders. The incident Matthew relates is peculiar for its location. In the reading today, Jesus has traveled beyond the borders of either Judea or Galilee, beyond Jewish territory. And in the chronicles of Jesus' journeys, we find that this was not a common occurrence. Uh, in fact, for Jews of that era, Tyre and Sidon were avoided, if at all possible. Writing within just a few decades of Jesus' earthly ministry, the Jewish historian Josephus noted, of all the Phoenician people, those of Tyre bear the most ill will against us, the Jews. This was therefore not like Oh, the crossing of a friendly border from, say, Michigan into Ontario, it would have been more like a Sunni Arab crossing into Shiite Iraq or a Pakistani crossing into India. Not quite so welcome. A woman identified in the gospel here as a Canaanite, in other words, a person of the indigenous population of Phoenicia rather than the Greeks that settled later, this woman approaches Jesus and shouts for aid and mercy, calling Jesus the Lord and the Son of David. These are surprising terms coming from a foreigner. Uh, you see, these are messianic titles. And so who is she, a Phoenician Gentile, to be expecting the Jewish Messiah? When we read how Jesus responded, some of us may be more than a little shocked. Did Jesus call her a dog? Whenever this passage comes up in Bible study or in the lectionary in worship, I hasten toward a little language study, for the word used in Greek is not really accurately reflected in most English translations. <clears throat> it's a reference to pet puppies, to doggies. The word, the Greek word is kuneroi, not 
kunos, which means a large dog, or a stray even. So this is like doggy, puppy. And I think it's used more as humorous banter and not as an insult. In asking her whether the children's food should be offered to the puppies, which, if you've ever had both children and small dogs in your home, you know it always is. Jesus is recognizing that the border between Jew and Canaanite is real, and he knew that his primary duty was to offer the good news, first and foremost, to those who were already expecting the Messiah. The Canaanite woman knew, of course, that treasured pets are always fed from the family table. Our, in my house, our little dogs certainly are, although they don't get people food because <clears throat> the vet frowns on that. The fact is that during his earthly ministry, Jesus was limited to how many miles he could walk in a day, how many people he could talk to in a day, how many hours he could work in a day, how many days he had to do his work before that day would come when he had a rendezvous with the cross at Golgotha. With such limits, Jesus knew that he had to maintain focus on the primary objective the mission of the Messiah to the Messiah's own people, the Jews. The expansion of that mission would follow soon enough in the wake of Easter when the early church came to realize the full scope of the resurrection meant that Christ was not only for the nation, but Christ was for the nations, plural. A clue to how the early church understood this incident of Jesus and the woman near Tyre and Sidon comes from fairly recent discoveries about the liturgical practices in the early church in the first century and how early Jewish Christians tailored their reflections on the life of Jesus according to the Hebrew Bible lectionary that was being used at the same time that century in the synagogues. And you can read about it in great detail in Liberating the Gospel, Reading the Bible from Jewish Eyes by John Shelby Spong. But without getting into the technical details of how these studies show the early Christian use of Jewish lectionaries, let me just note that in today's reading from Matthew about Jesus venturing across the border into Phoenicia, it would have been slated during the reading of the... Uh, lectionary for the Autumn Feast of Tabernacles. The corresponding readings from the Old Testament Torah for that season, carried into the church by long-established synagogue practice, would have included the story of how Moses sent 12 envoys into Canaan to scout the territory. Ah. And the reading from the prophets in the synagogue for that season would have included our reading today from Isaiah, which anticipates the age of the Messiah when all peoples of all nations gather to worship the one true God. So the message of our passage in Matthew would have been understood by these early Christians as an expansion of the gospel message beyond the original borders of Judaism to encompass all who call upon the name of the Lord. When the Canaanite woman calls Jesus Lord and calls him son of David, she has claimed the borderless love of God for herself and Jesus honored her faith, met her needs, healed her daughter. The Apostle Paul devotes much of his epistle for Christians living in Rome to the argument that Gentiles have been engrafted into the family of Abraham through faith in Christ. Or as New Testament scholar Christer Stendhal once put it, we who are Gentiles can rejoice that in Jesus Christ we become honorary Jews. The promise made to Abraham that through the promise made to him all nations would be blessed becomes effective for all who call upon the name of the Lord, as Paul insisted in the epistle that we had just last Sunday. 
God is generous to all. We at Westminster Church are engaged in mission to Sudan and Niger, beyond our borders, envoys of our church to minister God's healing love because we are convinced that God is indeed generous to all. The fabulous genius of the Bible is that God's universal love for all people could only come into human consciousness through the choice, first of all, of a particular people. And then in the coming of one particular person, the choice of Abraham's family was not so God could limit the gifts of love and mercy, but so that God could show generosity to all people. In Jesus Christ, the particular becomes even more so. One particular person through whom we become heirs of that original promise that was made to Abraham to become living demonstrations of God's purpose that all people come to know and worship the one true God of love. For us as Gentiles, the Canaanite woman who came shouting after Jesus one day is simply the first of us, we Gentiles, who explicitly claim Jesus as Lord and Messiah and Son of David. The extent of the gospel, my friends, knows no border. Only the simple confession of Jesus as Lord. No more, no less. May we be grasped by that faith in our risen Lord, knowing that borders to God's love are bygones, for God is generous to all. There are no borders. I am Carolyn Harp, deacon to 16 Westminster families. The Lord be with you and, and also, also with you. you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Creator God, we come before you today having experienced blessings that surround us in so many ways, we thank you for the ways that you make yourself known to us in the beauty of nature and the beauty of relationships we hold dear. We come before you today 
in an effort to still ourselves in your presence. In the unique realities we face in these days, we seek your peace instead of anxiety. We yearn for your joy instead of sorrow. We want to be part of movements that lead us forward in ways that include all people in the circle of your love. We as a country, Lord, are in need of your wisdom. Sickness and possibilities of infection are our realities. Racism and injustices persist. Inequality is a part of every aspect of our society. We seem to be more and more aware of the problems and less and less clear about the solutions. Our hearts are tired, and so is our strength of will. Guide us, we pray, to hold fast to your truths and examples of compassion as we seek to live our lives as your people. As a community, we mourn losses that surround us, losses of loved ones, losses of companionship, losses of physical and mental health, losses of things to look forward to and friends to do life with. Lord, give us a clear vision and purpose and courage to continue to pursue right paths as we seek to follow you. Help us to look to you and the examples you have set before us so we may be vigilant in following your way and your words of life. In days ahead, as we look forward to the arrival of our new pastor, the Reverend Chris Peters, be with us as we try to be faithful in all we do as your people. And guided by your calling to love and care for all, bind us together as we seek to do mission and ministry in this place called Westminster Presbyterian Church. I wrap these prayers up and offer them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Now and forevermore. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit abide with us all. Amen.